Simon is here for his uh, third and final lecture, so um, we have already know him pretty well. Probably no need to do much of an introduction, if any. Um, all I can say is that the other two have been very well received, so we're looking forward to number three. Well, thank you very much. And, and before I forget, I should, I should like to thank the SAGE Center for the invitation to come and the generosity that they've shown in bringing me here and housing me and, and hosting you. And to all of you that I've met, um, it's been great. And to those of you who haven't, who wanted to meet me, I'm sorry, but I'm off on Wednesday morning. Um, OK, so today I'm going to talk about the purposeful brain. And in, our, in the last lecture, I summarized the 10 principles of neural design that Peter Sterling and I um, we didn't derive them, we sort of just winkled out some that were already in the literature and thought of a few more of our own. And the problem with these principles is that they're all style and no content. They tell you that if the brain, if neural circuits are setting out to compute something to, for some particular purpose, then they should have regard to efficiency, and if they do that, they will code and they will structure themselves in particular ways, and they'll use particular sorts of computation, um, chemical or electrical or analog or whatever. But I became a neuroscientist because I wanted to understand how the brain processed information to generate behavior. And in fact, I was inspired by working was as a student by looking at insects and thinking, how can this little blob of jelly, which is the brain and the insect's head, produce all of this elaborate behavior and these wonderful responses and the ability to fly and, and all of these things? And so I was very interested in information processing. And so in this lecture, I'm going to return a little bit to my roots, my early roots, some early work I did, then move on to some recent work I've just done, and then finally end with a bit of perspective and speculation. So we've seen that neurons are very good at making connections and establishing relationships, and they form and circuits and direct them in a purposeful manner. And this ability to process information is very nicely illustrated by a classic preparation in invertebrate neuroscience, the crayfish. And in 1947, this gentleman, Cornelis Viersma, who was a pioneer of recording from the nervous systems of crustacea, crabs and crayfish, recorded responses of some very interesting neurons. Just a single action potential, just one single spike in one of these neurons would elicit a pattern suite of behavior. And this became known as a command neuron, for obvious reasons, a a term which Viersma himself questioned and has been hotly debated ever since. And Viersma's two command neurons, in fact there are two neurons, run from the head to the tail of, of the crayfish. And there are two neurons for two different sorts of escape behavior. And these different behaviors are produced, basically are pattern, two patterns of output produced by two patterns of input. And it's, on the surface, very, very simple, trivial almost. One giant neuron picks up n inputs from the head of the crayfish. And if those inputs are large enough, it fires an action potential which goes right down the crayfish's abdomen. And en route, it drives giant motor axons which produce very rapid contractions, strong contractions in the muscle. And so what happens is that the entire tail folds up underneath the crayfish like that, and it moves backwards. The lateral giant picks up inputs from the tail, and when it fires an action potential, it just contracts the muscles in these top segments. So instead of the, seg the abdomen going like that, the abdomen, in fact, goes like that. So it's, and that means that it rears up and shoots forwards. And these responses are extremely fast. They're, they're, they're 
the, the signals are generated in the motor in the in the two giant axons within milliseconds of mechanical stimulation of the head or the tail, but it has to be violent. In order, the stimulation has to be violent to initiate this escape, which is very expensive to generate in terms of muscle activity and really disruptive to the rest of behavior. And so the simple idea when people started was in fact that this is a piece of behavior produced by this mechanism which I reviewed in the first lecture, introduced in the first lecture, a simple method of de decision making where if the inputs to this neuron, excitatory inputs to this neuron are strong enough, then they produce an action potential and that leads to an action. And so the idea was that this was a really simple circuit for making a decision and, and then commanding the action. And indeed, in the first few years, when a small group of people, particularly led by Donald Kennedy in San Francisco in the, the mid-1960s, when they started working on this intensively, the first thing that they showed was that indeed a single, they identified the, the neurons and showed that a single action potential in this lateral giant did indeed produce the behavior, and that this action potential was triggered by the stimulation of motion-sensitive hairs on the, abdom on the tail of the crayfish. And in fact, when there were enough hairs were stimulated suddenly enough, this would fire an action potential. But you'll notice that the circuit is a bit more complicated than the minimum circuit you require. It's got this additional neuron here, and it's got two sorts of synapses, direct electrical connections and the chemical synapses I showed you before. And in the first phase of their work, they showed that this, this part of the circuitry here, the convergence of the motion-sensitive hairs and the action of these, motion, of these electrical and chemical synapses was very carefully engineered so that the decision to, to fire the giant axon was taken very quickly, but only in response to a large amount of incoming evidence, so you didn't get any false alarms. And in, in particular, there were nonlinear interactions between the axons of these sensitive hairs, and the electrical synapses would boost the speed of the response, but they needed the additional input via the chemical synapses and this interneuron to complete the excitation and get a response. So far, so good. But then they discovered that this simple circuit was in fact rather more complicated. The circuit has to deal with the real world. And the first thing they realized was that there was a great danger in this simple circuit of getting into a runaway positive feedback. Because when the, t when the crayfish flips its tail in response to the stimulation of a large number of receptors, that very violent movement of its tail stimulates the receptors again. And if you don't do something about this in this circuit, the, the, the crayfish will just flip itself to exhaustion. Um, so the next thing they discovered was that, in fact, a signal from the lateral giant goes off to a group of interneurons, which are inhibitory. So that once the lateral giant has fired a single action potential and triggered a flip, these inhibitory interneurons stop action potentials being generated again in the lateral giant. And they act at several different places simultaneously. They act on the output synapses of the, of the sensory receptors. They act on this, and they act on the input synapses of, onto the lateral giant, and also at the point here where the action potential is actually initiated. And this very effectively kills this positive feedback loop, which means that you don't get repetitive self-stimulation. And this very simple procedure of taking a copy of the motor signal and using it to gate, change the way in which sensory information is coming in, is very well known, was very well known to psychologists. And in fact, this was one of the first examples of it being seen in a, in a neural circuit. It's called efference copy. And if you want to know who first thought of e Efrance Coffee, it was in fact Helmholtz, 
the great 19th century German physicists and physiologists, who asked why it was when you moved your eyes across a scene, why didn't the world move in the opposite direction? And he reasoned that maybe when the motor part of the brain sent an order to the eye to move, the sensory part of the brain was given a copy of that order and used it to work out how far the image would move and made an equal and opposite image, uh, made an equal and op opposite apparent motion of the image and step or subtracting away what really happened. And he actually proved that this was a viable hypothesis, having warned people. He was a medical doctor as well, so don't try this yourself. But if you really press hard on your eye, you can stop it moving. And then when you will your eye to move in a particular direction, you see the world move off in the other direction. Yeah, so anyway, but here it is in a, in a crave. No, no, don't try it, <laughs> honestly. <yeah. laughs> believe, believe Helmholtz, he got the Nobel Prize. OK, so this is taking account of a consequence of its own action. They then went on and worked on this for another 10 or 15 years, this so-called very simple circuit, and showed that it also took account of the context within which the action was going to take place. They noticed that when crayfish were feeding, the threshold for escape went up. So they were less likely to escape from a good, really good place than any other place. And this was a kind of neuroeconomic decision. And they discovered that this effect was caused by a neuromodulator, a chemical transmitter, 5-HT, which acted on the membranes and the synapses in this region here to lower their sensitivity by producing inhibitory current in, in part. So there's a one effect of context is to do with whether you're feeding, and that's neuroeconomic. They also found that the threshold is changed <coughs> by the social status of the crayfish. So crayfish form dominance hierarchies by fighting with each other and threatening each other. And depending on your position in the dominance hierarchy, you will have a different threshold for this escape response. And that is actually produced by changing the effects of 5-HT, which they called metamodulation. So you can see that this simple circuit really isn't simple at all. That to be effective in the real world and make sure that the crayfish's behavior is well adapted for its situation and to avoid disastrous consequences of your own actions, then you need to have interactions within the circuit <coughs> that take care of this. And of course, that in fact, Donald Edwards has a nice review on this in which he shows that the 25 years of work on this so-called simple circuit produced fundamental principles of the neural control of behavior, of synaptic integration, of behavioral and plastic synaptic plasticity, neuroeconomical decision making, and social behavior. So this leads to the obvious conclusion that in fact there is no such thing as a simple circuit. Every action that a circuit is involved with happens in a context and has consequences. And if you make the connections that, that take account of these relationships, then your animal's chances of survival and reproduction could be increased. It will be a fitter animal in the biological sense. And we know, we've seen before that neurons are extremely good at making connections and establishing relationships. And this ability of neurons to connect and relate is exploited in even the simplest circuits in order to make the behavior more effective. So, no such thing as a simple circuit. Now, moving on to look at other properties of circuits, a, an engineer can look at a circuit in a large and complicated diagram and can identify um, what this particular little piece of circuit is doing by the pattern of the connections and the components involved. And this has led to the idea of there being circuit motifs, whereby circuits, neural circuits, have particular patterns of connection, and those patterns of connection are connected or 
sorry, I shouldn't say that, are associated with different functions. They're they constitute a particularly effective, good ways of performing particular operations. And so people have searched for motifs in neural wiring, wiring diagrams, and here's a, a little list brought by John Byrne. Plenty of other people have worked on this. And in fact, I've worked on this. When I started my PH, well, when, yes, when I started my PhD, I was interested in investigating a circuit in the insect eye, which had by, been identified by Cajal, who we came across in the first lecture, and his co-worker Sanchez, who did a lot of the insect work, had been identified as a motif that was found both in the insect compound eye, but also in the retinas of vertebrates, like you. So here is a circuit motif that you share with the insects. And they defined some structural elements to this motif, that defining structural elements was that it received the inputs from the photoreceptors. The photoreceptors, several photoreceptors, would generally converge onto one postsynaptic interneuron called a large monopolar cell, or OMC, in the insect, and a bipolar cell in, in the vertebrate. They connect at a distinct synaptic layer, so this constitutes a level of processing. It's the first level of processing in the visual system. And within this layer, let, there are in, interneurons which carry signals sideways. So they're in fact carrying signals that enable you, to, if you like, to compare the intensities, or use intensity signals from one little patch of the retina to code the intensity of the little adjoining patch. And so I set about recording from these neurons and the photoreceptors in the insects to discover what sort of processing was going on here. And I took advantage of the fact that the fly's compound eye and its visual system is the most beautiful crystalline optical and neural device. That on the compound eye, there are lots and lots of little facets, as you know, and each one of those facets is an optical unit which codes the intensity and color of light at one pixel, picture element, in the, in the image. And what Cajal and Sanchez realized was that there was one of these that, that for every optical unit, or the photoreceptor unit, for every p pixel, there was a processing unit at this first stage of processing, which they called laminar cartridge. And you can see there's a bundle of neurons all clustered together and then sending their axons out to the next layer, which is also arranged in cartridges. And in a beautiful piece of light and electron microscopy in the early 1970s, one of the world's finest neuroanatomists, Nick, Nicholas Straussfeld, Nick Straussfeld, assembled the neurons that are within, this, within each of these cartridges. So we had very good uh, ideas about what the neuron signals were receiving were and what the, what, what the outputs were. And we recorded from the neurons, and we discovered that the function, or at least one function of circuits, of these circuits, was to code contrast of stimuli, of optical stimuli, and protect them from noise. And working with Roger and Hardy, we showed that they used a very simple set of, very simple algorithm to extract contrast. The photoreceptor takes the logarithm of light intensity. It transmits it to the monopolar cell, but before it's transmitted, S uh, signals from surrounding modules are subtracted away. So the average light level in the surrounding part of the retina or the image is subtracted away from the signal coming in, and the residue is then amplified to fill the response of this range. And it's really obvious how this works. The whole principle of contrast, which was looked at by Helmholtz, in fact, Helmholtz said that contrast was a natural metric of vision. Contrast is simply taking the wiggle, which is caused by, which is the change in light intensity across the retina, and subtracting away and dividing it by 
a value of the local mean of that wiggle. So what does, why is this a natural metric? Well, if you are looking at a dark object on a white background, the white background might be four times brighter than the dark object. And that's because it reflects four times more of the instant light. If you now make the bright, if you now illuminate it a thousand times brighter, which happens during the course of the day, the difference between the black and the white is now a thousand times larger. But because each is reflecting a certain proportion of the instant light, when you divide through by the average, you get the same result. You, you get the same wiggle, although it's now superimposed on a signal which represents the background. So fluctuations in signal, which in light, are very different, even though they're produced by the same objects illuminated at two different levels, one ten times brighter than the other, in the photoreceptor are turned into wiggles of equal amplitude. They've been normalized. So now, in principle, they could look the same, except they're superposed on this background signal, so the next stage in the processing makes an estimate of the background signal by taking an average in the surrounding region and subtracting it away. And now the two signals produced by the same object under very different illumination look almost identical. And that helps the brain to generalize. It would be terrible if things look radically different under different levels of illumination. And unless you do something in the brain to make them look the same, they will carry on looking different. And this is the first and most probably effective stage in this process. But the problem is, because the photoreceptors are coding a very wide range of levels, oops, I'm going to put this through my shirt today, and this is obviously a, a bad move. This signal, the little wiggle which contains all the information about the world at a background light level, is very, very small. It's about three to four thousandths of a volt on average amplitude. And so that's easily lost in the hurly-burly of signals in the brain. So the next stage is to amplify this signal so it fills the response range of this neuron and it's now large and robust and easily seen. So this makes a lot of sense and we calculated that at the visual threshold for contrast of a fly, which had been measured as about 1%, this photoreceptor signal is about 40 millionths of a volt. So you really, by taking care of this problem, you can perform extremely well. Now, why? There's another pro thing that happens at this synapse, and that is that at this level, and that is as it passes through synapses from photoreceptors to monopolar cells, this tiny signal is protected from noise. So, as I remind you, a synapse, a chemical synapse, takes an electrical signal coming in here and uses it to trigger the release of vesicles of neurotransmitter which generate the signal in the synaptic, postsynaptic neuron. And these little vesicles pop out at random, because this is a molecular process, with a probability that depends on the amplitude of the incoming signal. And that means that there's a lot of random fluctuations, just like if, you, if it's just started raining and you put a card out and you look count the raindrops, if you put the card here and there are very few raindrops coming here and very few here and you compare the drops in the two cards, there will be different numbers of, of, of drops falling on the two cards because from instant to instant, they're falling out of the sky at random. And it turns out that the, if the number of vesicles released is NV, then the signal is going to increase with NV, and the noise is going to be the square root of NV. So the ratio between the signal and the noise is going to be the square root of NV. So as you have more of these vesicles being released, the ratio between the signal and the noise goes up. And the fly synapse, synaptic system, is highly specialized to release large numbers of vesicles. The mechanism which releases vesicles from photoreceptors is very sensitive to small changes in voltage. But in addition, 
the fly uses an amazing number of synapses to transfer the signal. There are six photoreceptors, and the neuroanatomy showed that there are 220 synapses on each photoreceptor. So there are 1,320 synapses working in parallel to send that signal from one pixel from one cell to the next. And that means you get a very good signal-to-noise ratio. In fact, the numbers of vesicles this system is handling is prodigious. Each photoreceptor terminal, which is only about 60 um, thousandths of a, of a millimeter long and about five thousandths of a millimeter in diameter, is releasing a quarter of a million, is releasing, sorry, over almost 550,000 vesicles per second. That's a very big load on the system. But it drastically reduces the effects of synaptic noise, thereby preserving that fragile information that you use to see with. So the first feature of this system were that there were these very sensitive synapses with many, many sites at w providing vesicles at many, many sites. Second feature of this system is that when you look at the connectivity with the electron microscope, you see that each synapse from a photoreceptor that's here, when it releases its vesicle, the contents go to at least uh, to, to four different neurons facing it. You can only see two cut in this section. So the vesicles released from one si release site drive four different postsynaptic neurons. And these are called tetrads. A third thing that we discovered in this is that the circuit chooses a very precise location at which to subtract away the presynaptic signal. It subtracts it away from the photoreceptor terminal just before vesicle release. And that means that it's regulating a limiting resource, which is the number of synaptic vesicles that are available there. If it was to act here, then you would use, have to use many more synaptic vesicles to carry this signal, and then you would subtract away a lot of the signal carried by that, those synaptic vesicles, the background component, and that seems rather, rather wasteful. So this all seems rather ar arcane, but it, it'll make sense in a minute. Finally, the mechanism which is used to remove the background signal is not another synapse. Another synapse, another chemical synapse, would be equally noisy. So you would need 40,000 of these per photos. You would need 220 of these per photoreceptor to subtract the background. The fly does something completely different. So what the fly does is that it regulates the electrical flow of current around the neurons. So when the neurons respond to light, they, make a, they go more positive, and that means that current flows out of their terminals adjacent to the interneurons. And this, air, this zone, synaptic zone, within which the synapses lie, is surrounded by a barrier. And the current has to return in its circuit back here to where it came from, and in doing so, it has to cross the barrier, and that barrier has an electrical resistance. And very simple uh, Ohm's law sort of circuits that you drew at high school, many of you probably, show that what you should expect to see is that when the photoreceptors depolarize to light, go positive, and drive current into here, there should be a depolarization as this current returns across a resistance barrier to the retina. And Matty Vekstrom and I found a clever way of recording this extracellular potential, and we recorded this positive going extracellular potential, as you would predict from this type of circuit. And what that means is that when the photoreceptor generates a positive going signal, the synapse sees not the whole signal here, it sees the difference between this signal and the signal on the other side of the membrane. And that subtracts away from this, from this signal, and that's actually an estimate of the background which is subtracted away. And as far as I know, this is a unique mechanism. Nobody's 
Uh, it's a member of a class of mechanisms which labor under the title of effactic in interactions. But what, what it basically boils down to is that this background component is subtracted directly, not using synapses with vesicles, but by regulating current flow in the surrounding neurons and extracellular space. Well, that looks like a very clever system. But it turns out that when you look at all of the, these properties which we deduced, they're all found in the analogous mammalian system that's working in your retina. So the fly achieves its purpose using this set of mechanisms in this motif, and the mammal, your retina or fish retina, using slightly different mechanisms, does the same things. It has specialized synapses which release large numbers of vesicles with high gain. The background signal is created by lateral interneurons called horizontal cells, and these subtract it away at this level of this presynaptic terminal. And they use a set of unorthodox mechanisms, one of which is to suck current in and out of the extracellular space, just like is happening in the fly, or analogous to what's happening in the fly. But another is to change the pH, the acidity of the extracellular medium, which changes the sensitivity of protein molecules responsible for driving the synapse. But it's unorthodox, non-synaptic. And in addition, each vesicle drives several post-synaptic elements. So here we have this little circuit in both retinas. It's implementing this, its basis is this structural motif that was seen by Cajal. It's implementing similar procedures, which are really good for coding contrast in the two systems. So it has analogous functions, which are very demanding. And it's using very, very similar mechanisms. So what's the advantage of this? And it turns out that the use of these mechanisms and the configuration of this little circuit here have very beneficial economic consequences for the brain. And this is work that I'm currently writing up. So how can we cost the benefits of having this configuration of circuit? Well, it turns out it's quite straightforward because we have a very detailed analysis circuit diagram of, the lam of this lamina cartridge made using the electron microscope in which the position of every synapse was identified and lo was located, and the numbers of synapses counted. And the first person to do this, Ian Meinertzhagen, compared axons in a number of different species of fly, and in fact, it axons of different lengths in different regions of the fly's eye, and he found wherever he looked, the density of these synapses was constant. There was, on average, one synapse per 1.6 square microns of membrane area. So that means that each synapse has to occupy its own region of real, have to, has to have its own little region of real estate, comes with it. So if you make more of these synapses, you have to make a longer axon to accommodate them. And that's your cost, and it turns out that the volume, because the radius of these axons tends to be fairly constant, the length and volume of this structure increases in proportion to the number of synapses, as does the energy cost. And that's how we can look at the economic consequences. And what follows is really elementary. First thing is, each vesicle drives several postsynaptic elements. That means that this structure here is equivalent to four synapses, each driving their own output element. And I'm astonished nobody had ever observed this, this before, which means you get a four-fold reduction. You make it a quarter of the size by doing this. And if you have n of these postsynaptic elements, you will increase its efficiency by n-fold. So, Whereas we had a motif for vi divergence in John Byrne's diagram, which looks like this, a vesicle-efficient divergence system looks like that. 
And these divergent synapses are commonly used in insect brains. So now let's think about removing the background presynaptically. We're going to regulate the synaptic vesicle release. And if you make best use of your vesicles, then you can reduce the number of sites at which you have to, 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 to release them because you're going to be using the vesicles efficiently. So now, you remember me saying that when you increase the background light intensity, shown here as the log of intensity, in the photoreceptor, you get a signal which increases with background, and on top of that are these wiggles due to changes in contrast. And the average amount of contrast signal will, will stay the same at any background. It will just rise up with the background. Now imagine you're going to put this signal through a set of synapses. And you have enough synapses so that you can get a maximum vesicle relate, re release rate of Vmax. Now the noise in this vesicle stream is going to be on average the square root of Vmax, which is a little thing like this. In this system, at any one background, you're only using a tiny fraction of this range to code contrast because a lot of it is coding the background and has pushed it up and it hasn't got into this region either. So this is a very inefficient use of the vesicles. The signal to noise ratio, the ratio between that and that is about three to one. If we eliminate the background signal, we no longer have the background. So we can amplify the signal to fill the vesicle signal range and it will fill it independent of the background that we're at. And we measured this amplification, and it's times 6.5. So the signal-to-noise ratio increases by 6.5 for using a given number of vesicles just by eliminating the background. This is very efficient. It turns out to be spectacularly efficient if you ask the question, well, if I tried to do this some other way, what would it be like? Well, the other way would be to increase the total number of synapses to get, use, to get the signal-to-noise ratio back up to the value you want. But there, the signal-to-noise ratio goes as the square root of the number of vesicles. So in order to get a 6.5 improvement, you have to have 6.5 squared as many more vesicles, which is 40 times more. So by removing the background signal presynaptically, you have reduced the size of the, this structure by times 40 and made a 40-fold saving in materials and energy. So this is a spectacular improvement. If you think of subtracting with an unorthodox vesicle mechanism, you've got no vesicle noise, you're going to need fewer synapses, you can use ex existing currents and signals, and you're utilizing the glia, the su so-called support cells of the neurons, which in fact play an important role in neural processing. And just that for those of you who are neuroscientists, the third most common synapse in this system is the, 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 neuro, the cell that receives the third largest number of synapses in this system are the glia. So they're really rather active components. We take a guess that that might improve the efficiency by, say, 25%. When we put it all together, we see that by having multiple postsynaptic elements, removing the background presynaptically, and using a non-vesicular mechanism, you've got somewhere between 160 to 200 times more efficient use of materials and space, and between 40 and 60 times more efficient use of energy. So given this massive increase of inefficiency, it's hardly surprising that this motif has been adopted not just at the structural and the processing level, but at the mechanistic level, because these are spectacular <coughs> savings. And for the fly, if the, the lamina, this synaptic zone, is 10% of the brain's volume, without the motif, it would be 95% of the brain's volume, and the, the brain would be 17 times bigger. 
The resting, it accounts for 2% of the metabolic rate of the fly. Without the motif, it would be 45% of the metabolic rate. And it would, the metabolic rate of the fly, resting metabolic rate, would be one and a half times bigger. So these are big efficiency savings. And it's a multifaceted, so what we have then is a multifaceted <coughs> motif. We have retinal circuits that are identical in structure and function and mechanism because they have a similar purpose. They use similar procedures because they're effective. They have similar architectures because, and they use similar mechanisms because this makes them more efficient. And this is the first time that anybody has actually identified an efficiency benefit from a circuit motif. Now, there are loads and loads of motifs around. And I'll just to show you a couple of other ones, this is a motif that generates signals cycle around this little um, circle of neurons, or this little triangle of neurons. And they produce the regular alternations of stepping that you find in vertebrates, but also in insects, in crayfish, and also in the swimming of, of, of mollusks, and so on. And this is a very common motif that's used for pattern recognition and learning, where samples from a small number of cells are projected onto a very large number of cells, each one of which only picks up a small number of synapses. So each one of these cells is driven by a unique combination of input neurons. And that's very useful for learning and for pattern recognition. And that's seen in the mushroom bodies of insects, <coughs> but it's also seen in your cerebellum, for example. So I'm not going to dwell on motifs any longer. There are many, many more of them. I'm going to go now to what people think is a, is a, is a problem with motifs, as we currently understand them. So I think many cognitive neuroscientists will say, well, this is all very well. But these are really quite simple mechanical sorts of things, like you would find in a, in a digital camera or in image processing or in a simple control system for a robot. And really smart things that you do, like make statistically well-informed decisions, they might require a bigger brain and more sophisticated circuitry. And I'm going to just re very quickly review a paper which suggests that that's not necessarily true. This is work by Gerhard Miesenbrook's books group in, in Oxford. And what they did was they took flies and they exposed them to a very faint odor, 20 parts per million of this fairly benign molecule MCH. But they paired it with an electric shock. So every time the fly smelt this stuff, it got an electric shock. And they did that 20 times. And not very surprisingly, the flies learned that when this stuff appeared, they wanted to get away from it. And they placed them in a chamber where there was 20 parts per million metabolic uh, MCH coming in in the airflow in one direction, and a lower concentration between 10 and 18 parts per million coming in <coughs> in the opposite direction. <coughs> And the fly would hover around in this decision zone, and it would then move off to either, one, to either end. And what they found was that the time that the fly took to make its decision went up as the decision got more difficult, as the ratio between the concentrations in the two ends approached one, and there was no difference. The fly took more time. And as, the, as it became more difficult, the accuracy of the response went down. This is typical. This was discovered, first of all, in 1869 by Donders. And it's very typical of this, this sort of decision, integrating noisy, unreliable signals coming in to make a decision as to whether one, it's one or the other, and then taking action. This is very typical. We do this. Loads and loads of animals do this. And you can fit this sort of decision making with a very simple model. And this is, the, this is the fit of the model. And this model, which was first developed looking at human behavior, again, has been successfully applied, in sometimes in more complicated forms. And it's called a drift diffusion model. And the model simply says that 
the system accumulates evidence. As signals come in, it gets evidence saying, oh, it's higher at this end than at that end. But then it'll get, a bit later, a bit of evidence says, no, it's higher at that end. And so, as the evidence accumulates, sometimes it says it gets the wrong evidence, and sometimes it gets the right evidence. And as it accumulates more evidence, the total amount of evidence for doing something approaches some level, which is a threshold. And at that threshold, you say, OK, I'm convinced now. It is lower at this end, so I'm going to go to that end. So the S the, you, you integrate evidence over time. And when it reaches a threshold, you decide to act. And what Miesenbroek and their colleagues showed, first of all, that there are neurons involved in this in the Drosophila brain. And by mutating a particular <coughs> gene, they could find that the fly, when you had a mutation in this gene, FOXP, which is a regulator, the fly accumulated evidence more slowly. And so it took longer to take to a decision, and in fact, its decisions were less reliable. So this was a behavioral experiment, and they could fit the behavioral experiment with a drift diffusion model. And these are the two predictions of the drift diffusion model. These are two runs of the two drift diffusion models, the normal fly and the mutant fly. And then they made recordings from a neuron which expresses this gene, FOXP. And there are only 160 in the fly brain, so they kind of hit it lucky here. And when you record the electrical potential of this neuron, as the evidence accumulates, the membrane potential goes up and up and up. And when it gets to a threshold, it fires a spike. And the distribution of these spike timings was very close to the distribution of times to response that they measured in their behavioral in their, in their behavioral experiments. And the mutant neurons showed, whoops, showed the same sort of behavior as the models that they had deduced in, from the behavioral experiments. So the, the, the mutant neuron looks as if it's got a much leakier integrator of evidence, that the evidence has less effect and it doesn't hang around for so much time. And it turns out that this mutation increases the number of channels that are open in the membrane and actually makes the membrane leakier. But the point is that here we have something which was originally deduced from human behavior as being a very efficient means of making a statistically informed decision and is widely employed in the animal kingdom being implemented at the level of single neurons. And as they graphically show in the, in the sort of pictorial summary of their paper, the only bit I could understand, in the pictorial summary, they graphically show that you really don't need anything that's terribly sophisticated to do this. This is a statistically efficient behavioral judgment, but you can make it with a very simple mechanism, a leaky bucket. The evidence drips in from the tap, the bucket gets fuller, as the tap puts in more positive evidence. But if the bucket is leaky, like in these FOXP neurons, then it takes much longer to fill up. And the point is that the sort of processes, the sort of analog processing that has to go on to make this statistically well-informed, efficient decision doesn't have to be very complicated. It just has to have the right properties. And in fact, I think this is, a, this is a paper that all neuroscientists should look at. Even plants make statistically well-informed decisions. So this was an experiment. Actually, some of you might know this person, Alex Kachelnik. He's a very prominent figure in the study of risk aversion and choice behavior in animals. And he's also a theoretical economist. He's won prizes in economics. And he collaborated with these Israeli botanists. And what they did was they put plants, they split their roots in two halves so that the two halves of the root system grew in two different plots. And one plot was a very risky pot in which the amounts of nutrients and things fluctuated violently over time. And the other plant was a very safe pot 
in which the nutrients were stable. And if the nutrients are sufficient to sustain good growth, so that you will, you're absolutely bound to make lots of seeds, which was their measure of fitness, then the plant invests more in the constant than in the risky. But if the nutrients, the average level of nutrients, is so low that the plant cannot possibly make enough seeds, it invests more in the risky plot. Because in the risky pot, there's always a chance it will get enough nutrients to make some seeds. So, and this turns out to fit the predictions of risk sensitivity theory, as developed by economists. But the mechanism the plant uses to do this is still unknown. But they have all those intracellular, they have a computer in every living cell, and the cells can communicate. So, in my three lectures, I hope that I've managed to demonstrate that brains consume significant quantities of resources and that they're using these to make the connections and establish the relationships that essentially are behavior. But their usage is limits neural function according to constraints, inevitable constraints imposed by physics, like geometry, electrical properties, chemistry, reaction rates, diffusion, and so on, and by cell biology. And second lecture, I showed that these limitations generate design principles which help us to understand the structure and function of these circuits um, by showing how you can, how particular configurations of neurons, particular types of computation you're going to use, particular geometries, will enable you to use these resources more efficiently. So by adhering to these principles, single neurons and small circuits can meet many of the specifications for well-informed behavior. And that these small circuits, consequently, to have better behavior, which takes better account of consequence, makes better predictions of future outcomes, and so on, makes better account of context, these circuits are made more complicated to take account of this. And neurons have evolved for exactly this sort of purpose. They're fantastic at making con connections and establishing relationships. And so this, I think, raises some interesting prospects. And some of this is just purely ignorant speculation on my part, but it's always fun to look ahead. So there's a lot of, well, there's a small group of very enthusiastic people doing behavioral experiments on insects showing that they can use tools, showing that they will learn to use these tools more quickly if they're shown other insects doing the same thing. That they can see a color at one point in, in, a, in, in a maze, and when they get to the choice point, they can learn that they should pick the color to get a reward that they saw earlier. So they're able to plan and project in time, and whoops, and many, some of, these, some of these behavioral tasks or behavioral capabilities have been used by people who think about the evolution of con cognition. They've used these to define higher cognition. So what constitutes higher cognition is brought in, if we think higher cognition in particular, if we think it's, we refer to ourselves, is brought into some doubt. And in fact, I think that many of the computations which are required to process information effectively are present in very small circuits. As I've shown, you can make statistically well-informed decisions and so on. So perhaps the advantage of a bigger brain is that you can connect and relate greater numbers of events in greater depth and with increasing complexity. And that's kind of obvious. But it's getting away from the idea that there are particular tasks that define this higher cognitive ability. I think we have to find tasks which do a better job at teasing this apart. And then once we've found this, we're in a better position to ask, how are the br larger brain's neural circuits organized to gain these advantages? Because increasing scale and increasing complexity 
If you're to do that efficiently and effectively, you're going to have to change your organization. And new principles of processing might emerge. So there are going to be many, many more than 10 principles of neural design. That's just the beginning. Thank you. Okay, um, open for questions. Anybody? Uh, yeah, let me give you. Uh, <laughs> I was just curious of an example of an insect using a tool. So these are experiments done by Lars Chitka in um, Queen Mary College in London on bumblebees, where bumblebees will learn to, if you cut, they covered a food source that the bumblebee knew was there with a little flap and there was a piece of string on the end of the flap, and the bumblebees learnt to pull on the piece of string to expose the flap so they could then feed on it. So only about 20% of bumblebees sort of worked this out for themselves, but when they had other bumblebees in parallel sort of plexiglass chambers observing closely the bumblebees that pulled on the flaps and got the reward, those bumblebees learnt to do it quicker when they tested them. That was really fascinating. I'm wondering if there's any examples of any of these circuitry motifs that you've seen at these lower levels um, at being ap applicable at a higher level of organization where you sort of see some sort of similar homology, not just between cells uh, or neuron circuits in insects and mam mammals, but maybe the same sort of process but happening at a larger scale. So yes, I think the obvious example here is work on this associational ganglion that, that all insects have. In fact, it's even in worms. It's a very ancient thing. It's called a mushroom body because it's mushroom shape. And you get information coming in through a fairly small number of fibers. And that information is projected onto a very large number of fibers, each one of which only gets a tiny subset of the, um, connects to a tiny subset of the lines coming in. And this gives you the ability to break down without any prior knowledge the information coming in into lots and lots of little subsets. And each one of those will represent a particular sort of pattern. And then there are actually synapses on the outputs of these so-called Kenyan cells, which are looking at little subsets which are punished or rewarded depending on whether the pattern that stimulated them gained a food reward or led to a punishment. And so this is a way of learning patterns very effectively over large data sets by sp spreading the, the information sparsely over large numbers of neurons and each one of which takes care of a little part of the pattern. And that's precisely what happens, well it's not, it's analogous to what happens in your cerebellum which you use for motor learning and possibly in your cortex as well. And that emerged in worms, where it's actually probably connected with olfaction, where you have to have some form of pattern recognition to be able to recognize odors, because there's no spatial pattern in olfaction, that things don't map out in space like in vision. Yeah, I want to ask you a question about the um, synaptic divergence. Uh, it's, you know, the um, likelihood of the postsynaptic uh, signal firing has a lot to do with release probability. Yeah. But now you introduce another level of probability on there about which particular synaptic element is going to be sufficiently depolarized to get a signal. So your point is you've actually ma you've made it even sparser. That's right. Yeah. But actually you've done that by introducing some unreliability, and that seems uh, to be a cost. Yes. And I'm not sure anybody's really looked at the balance between those two competing factors. I don't mm -hmm. know. John. Um, very interesting. So uh, inspired by your program of being maximally neurally reductive of the highest possible thing, uh, I was thinking as you were speaking that consciousness, uh, which is the great uh, Abrea tar pit of mystical concepts here, uh, that you might think of it as uh, potentially uh, 
taking larger and larger dimensions of context into account to factor them out to get residual, extremely precise local signals that would otherwise be lost in noise, something like that? Well, yes and no. I've, I've, because I am a neural reductionist, and I'm not ashamed of this, it's, it's the sort of explanation that I decided as a very young scientist that I would like to get. And I, um, in my youth, I thought that this was kind of, you know, the one true path and so on, and I got very angry with people who took, or at least I took exception to people who looked in other ways. But as I've <coughs> matured, I've realized that, in fact, these are all difficult problems, and we need to look at them at, at in, in different ways. But I've, <laughs> I've run away from consciousness because I think it's in the, I mean, <laughs> I think I, I sort of agree with Daniel Dennett that consciousness that is something that, that's sort of created to help us survive better. And the thing that I think might be missing in your description is that, in fact, it doesn't at any one instant keep track of very much stuff. It's looking selectively and sort of bringing to mind those things that might be important, but somehow things that it doesn't expect come in and, and immediately enter our conscious perception. So it's, it's putting together things that we have to respond to and evaluate in some sort of framework that, that kind of works. And I, I leave it at that, because um, I'm, I'm totally perplexed. I have a suspicion that, like learning, when somebody finds a simple model of consciousness, even though it's quite um, quite convincing, people will say that can't possibly be consciousness because it's simple. <laughs> uh, yeah, here's a, uh, I think it's a simpler question. It doesn't involve <laughs> consciousness. Maybe it's too simple and no I should know. Thing as a simple I should know <laughs> this, but I, I want to be, I want to learn this. Um, tell me if, you, uh, because I don't know, uh, what is the relationship, bet, you know, uh, between the noise at the synaptic level that you were discussing and the contribution of that versus the noise at the action potential level? action potentials and is there a statistical relationship are those correlated or those so what is yeah I don't know much about that but I want to know so there's so in this particular system in the fly and in your vertebrate retina uh, at least in the fly you don't meet action potentials for at least another layer of processing um, so but in a very small number of cases where people have asked the question is a single action potential a significant event in the, the com capable of producing a measurable influence on behavior? They've set up situations in which they can show that it is. So in at absolute threshold in a, in a rodent, um, the response that's just seen as light corresponds pretty much to one action potential in a ganglion cell. And in the barrel cortex of rodents, where um, neurons are processing inputs from one whisker it, the, in the cortex, this is a cortical structure, a single action potential in one neuron can in fact change the output of the, of, 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 of the barrel and have a measurable influence on behavior. But those are extremes. In many other cases, they, they, um, they may not. But this all kind of fits in with the idea that, that, you that the action potential, you want to send only what's needed, one of our principles, that you want to make sure that the action potential does carry something significant. So it doesn't surprise us that single action potentials can have a consequence, as in the crayfish. So I haven't answered your question. I think it's an interesting one, and there will be probably lots of situations in the, in the brain where that doesn't I hold. Mean, you, have a, you have a number there, a quarter of a million, you were interviewing a, a, across a quarter of a million, you were saying that there was some reduction of the noise by, by some integration of a quarter of a million of these. Synaptic vesicles. That seems a lot of reduction. I don't think you have a, a, a single, and then you have the actual. Oh, sorry, no, no, so, okay, ah, okay, yeah, no, so. So there's an old, so when people first found neurons were noisy, 
they said, okay, this doesn't look very good for the brain, but the brain's got millions of neurons, so you can average out over them and get a reliable estimate. That turns out to be a lousy, inefficient way of achieving accuracy. And I would put it the other way around, that because there you can see the noise, you haven't over-engineered it. And yes, you can, if you have sparse data coming in, you can use, and this happens in vision, you can use massive summation to improve your sensitivity. Of course that happens. But as a general strategy for reducing noise in the brain, massive parallel transmission is the method of last resort, we call it in our book whether you do it with molecules or vesicles, because it's so inefficient. You're much better trying to boost the signal, which is actually what that little synaptic motif showed. Okay, well, Simon, thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming, and thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure.